One of the things that I realize as, uh, as an art historian is that the very title of this exhibition is so, uh, it's so appropriate, making Africa. Africa is like clay. Uh, you, it's something that is always been made. Uh, something that is very plastic, something that can easily adapt. And uh, uh, if you shape it in one way, it is still, it can still take a different kind of shaping. And it's always in the process of evolving. So it's so much, it's like, uh, it's like, a, it's a, it's like a drawing. You can keep changing it. Uh, like a painting, like a canvas, you can keep writing into it, and you can take it, and that is the the, the beautiful part of it. And my reading of of Africa is that uh, we are all immigrants in Africa, whether we leave the continent or we don't physically leave the continent. We are all immigrants. We are all um, on this migration, this journey of migration. And the journey of the immigrant can be defined in uh, three processes. In terms of exit, in terms of exile, and in terms of exodus. Exit is the moment in which you leave that space that is native to you. Exile is the, the period in which you begin to adapt yourself into the space to which you have emigrated. And the exodus is always necessary in the sense that the space of exile is not always the space that you anticipated you would be in. It surprises you in many ways. And you have to make a return. And that is the exodus. And um, um, my question to my really wonderful uh, friends is at what moment my first question would be, at what moment did you feel this compulsion to either physically mm. or mentally make an exit out of Africa? Because in many ways, you, a lot of people who actually physically live in Africa themselves, they are in some kind of emotional uh, exit even though they occupy that same space. So at what point did you find it necessary? Or did it become uh, uh, just necessary, important for, for you to move out? And what happened to create that, that moment? I tell you. <laughs> I almost want to say not applicable. Um, <laughs> um, I think it's an interesting question, um, especially for me, just because that wasn't really like a choice, you know? And I think for many of us, it wasn't a choice, right? You, um, a lot of people immigrate in, in childhood and, and all these other things, but I think the, the, the thing that it made me think of is um, what, what kinds of things drive that impulse um, mentally or philosophically? And as you said, that first thing that you said about a lot of us um, first doing these kind of these careers to satisfy our parents, I think in many ways, like that for me is what symbolizes that as well, right? Like, so um, during the time that the show actually went up, I was a very unhappy PhD student, um, not being able to do my practice as a designer, mostly because um, of the struggle of like, okay, how will you eat and all these things. And it's really this fight of legitimacy 
which I, I think comes back to um, wanting to or, or seeing things that are, are seen as valid in the West and seen as valid in um, what's held high in Western logic, which is like enlightenment, rationalistic, um, science-oriented thinking and wanting to use that as a safe haven to think that that will be your salvation, right? Whether it be like um, physically moving into those things um, by, by choosing to come here from, from the African continent or mentally and philosoph philosophically moving into those things by um, trying to have a career in that way. And um, I think I, I, I was always kind of in that place. Um, I, I think that, that that was given to me in since since I was a, a very very young child. Like, you know, we have this background. We are education is important. That's how you make it in America. X, Y, and Z. And um, it's only as I got older that I was like, well, I actually think that these things that are, are inherent to me and that feel like a pull inside of myself are also valid and can also feed me and also have um, legitimacy as, as ways of existing and, and ways of thinking about value. She actually occupies a very different space. <laughs> um, uh, she was born here. But I knew her mother way back in the 70s. She, her mother was uh, a radio star uh, who did this uh, program that everybody, the entire country stopped when her program was on. But suddenly, she disappeared. Her mom disappeared. And next thing, she appeared in the United States. And this is what came out of that. <laughs> like, um, exactly nine months later. <laughs> but the, 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 the beautiful thing, though, what is so fascinating about her that I, 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 I see as um, the work that her mom did was the way in which she speaks Yoruba just like I do. She speaks the language perfectly well, like she was born in Yoruba land. So um, that has been something that the, the, one of the ways through her mom made this return, so to say, through her children. So that is in, in a situation in which she's totally different from Wale, right? Segway. Um, <laughs> so I think it, in terms of migration generally, there are, it's taken me a while to get to the point that I am now because I'm now a parent and I have some perspective. Not all the perspective, but some. And I think less in terms of what I may have lost by being brought here against my will as a child. Not kidnapped, but being brought by parents. Um, <laughs> save me. Um, I think in terms of what I've gained. So it's highly unlikely I would be in the situation that I am in now if I had not left the place of my birth just by virtue of their not having the same opportunities. So again, much as we, many of us, rightfully love to malign the nation of America, where else can you go to end up in this chair in front of this audience, mm -hmm. having been an immigrant and then been a musician, a lawyer, and still get a third chance at that to go be an artist and mm -hmm. maybe screw that up and go make bread. I don't know, what's next? <laughs> Catch me six months. But the point being, you know, every coin has two sides. So while my Yoruba is passable but not as fluent as I would like, I get to be this person who probably wouldn't have been this person if he didn't leave. And, and then I think now, because I have a child, of the choices my parents had to make to leave, now seeing them in their waning years, the lack of the social circle that they voluntarily surrendered so that their kids could grow up to squander away a legal education, because in America you can, right? And so you think about them. And they didn't come here just to like, they could have stayed home and hung out and been with their friends. But they chose to leave. And, and that choice to leave is, is much more, it's much greater sacrifice when you know what you're leaving. Whereas when you're eight years old, it's like, oh, you got hamburgers here? I'm going, cool. <laughs> but for them, it's, well, I'm leaving who I am 
what I know, what I love, hmm. to face a nation and a society that sees me generally as less than, regardless of my accolades and degrees and what have you. And this is the story of immigration generally. So you come into a new place, you start at the bottom no matter what degree you have. If you're a physician, if you're X years old, you're going back down to residency and fight it off with the 20 year olds. Yeah. And so these are things that if you're a child who's brought here, you don't think about. You think about being upset because you can't hang out with your best friend anymore, which is a fair and true emotion to have, but you're not seeing the wider scope, nor should you because you're a child. So back to your question, um, I didn't choose to leave. I think that because I'm very grateful for who I am and what I have, I'm all I can be is grateful. So, yeah. Thanks, buddy. What about uh, Nusa? Um, I guess all of our stories are pretty different because my dad was posted to DC for work. So I left Nigeria at 14. Um, but I was not happy to leave. Um, but it was also, it seemed that that was the next step for anyone who was able to. Um, being in school in Nigeria was like, your education's gonna be better there. You're gonna have more opportunities there. That was the narrative that was um, kind of repeated over and over. Um, and I was also there at the time where Sani Abacha was um, the head of state. Um, so, like I was Th Tell us about Abacha. Huh? Abacha. Who was Abacha? Sani Abacha was um, a cruel head of state. Um, he basically took over after Babangida. Okay. Sorry. I'll restart. So, so um, he ran the country between, I want to say, 94 until he passed away in 98. And he was the head of state who basically was a dictator. We had no freedoms. He came in after canceled elections in, um, I want to say, 92. Sorry. Um, my history is like, timeline is like shaky. Um, but I remember that at home, we didn't say anything negative about the government because you never knew who was watching. Um, he was also respons responsible for the death of Ken Sarwiwa. Um, and those are some of the things I remembered. I also remembered from being in school, that was a time where bribes and bribery act and corruption just kind of went, became institutionalized and rampant. And I was explaining to you in the back how I went to one of, one of the school that was considered one of the best schools in the country, Queens College. And by the time I left, um, they had gotten rid of our headmistress who was trying to keep, maintain the quality of the school. and. They basically flooded it with anybody who could afford to pay a bribe in order to get in. So I went from, you know, classroom. My classroom was about 40, 40 people, I want to say, when we started. And by the time I left, it was 100 kids in a class. Um, and I'm, I'm talking about like a homeroom <laughs> that was made for 20, 30 people. And we were like sharing desks and things like that. So it started to feel like this was the time people wanted to leave. There was an embargo on, there was a, um, there were sanctions on Nigeria, which were somewhat like lessened, so they allowed the diplomatic corps to leave and be posted, which was when we left. Um, and it felt like it was time to go in a weird way. Like it wasn't my decision, but it felt like this was the next step um, because you weren't sure what the states of the state of the universities were going to be. You weren't sure what the state of the um, schools, the um, high schools and elementary schools were gonna be. Um, things were kind of going into a state of decay. Um, and, and as sad as I was to leave all my friends, I didn't ha really have a choice in the matter. Um, you know, what ultimately led me to going back home because I felt like, I felt lost when I was here for a while. Um, I changed the way I spoke. Um, I didn't have really an understanding. I kind of forgot where I came from and who my people were um, because I wasn't around any of them. And then my decision to go back was also an independent, it was an independent decision and I just felt like I was missing something. I didn't know what it was, but I, I felt like I needed to find myself back home and that's why I went back to Nigeria. 
Very good. Uh, you, you have, you've, you've actually spanned the entire oh, sorry. journey, <laughs> which, is, which, is really, which is really wonderful. Um, and it's, it's, it's fascinating to, for instance, ask someone like uh, Ayoteju how, despite the fact that you were born here in the United States, um, did you ever feel a sense of alienation? Yeah, I was actually going to say that um, it's really interesting thinking about those three steps and hearing other people's stories because I feel like I really entered in like being born in exile, right? And 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 uh, thinking about what that means and what that that um, meant for me. I am middle child, and I was the weird one. Um, amongst my siblings in that I remember from a very young age always complaining to my mom that I don't know why she didn't give birth to me in Nigeria which like now <laughs> I can um, kind of wrap my head around uh, the, the privileges that are tied into that and all these things but I have always from a very 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 young age more than my siblings or more than my sister who was who was born in Nigeria um, felt like my my culture sp specifically as a yoruba was me and and felt a really deep and tender closeness to that and even to like and and even to the connections of the things that were happening so i was 8 when um abacha died and i remember that day just because of you know what my life was like and what, like literally though vividly as an eight-year-old being like whoa this thing has happened um because of what my life was like and who my mother is and and the things that i was exposed to and i always describe to people that um as a child in primary school like my only kind of american experiences were one uh in the morning when i was dropped off by my father at school <laughs> you know, until uh, three o'clock or whenever it was that I that I went home because my weekends and everything was just, my mosque was Yoruba, uh, my parties were Yoruba, my house was Yoruba, my aunts and uncles and the people I interacted with, which meant that I, I did and honestly quite like often still do feel a deep sense of alienation or strangeness um, being here. I have the privilege of mobility as an American citizen, being able to move in and out of this space, but I don't identify um, or really feel like there's, there's um, like I found a space for me or a space for belonging here in this country. You know, I identify um, as a Nigerian and even more as a Yoruba Nigerian, right? Because that's specific and, and that's what I grew up inside of. Um, the experiences that you have, which I feel like have like, you know, people have probably heard a lot of them at this point, but um, being from elsewhere and, uh, eating different foods and 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 especially like growing up in the hood in, in america is like it's very hard um you're constantly reminded that you are other mm. um it was a very long time like even though i was born in this country and all things was very very i was very old before i um even identified as black because i grew up in african american communities that were like no you you're, you're African and that's something else, you know, and constantly feeling that separation. So of course I also felt home. My closest friends were other Yoruba Muslim kids that I went to mosque with or that I would see at a party that were all my cousins and things like that. Um, so I, I, I really think it's an, it's an ongoing thing for me. Um, but to be honest, there is a, a deep sense of belonging um, for me within the space of home. And, and so that's kind of the, the trade-off, you know, like um, to be able to finally really mark and, and feel like, okay, like, yes, Nigeria is my place, specifically Lagos has become a, a space of belonging for me where I can see myself and see my future and, 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 and see the things I want to create to, um, to make a different world. Um, the trade-off is like, you know, feeling a bit more alien here, um, and that's okay for me. Uh, thank you. Uh, Wale, 
you, you've been able to find uh, an incredible space in the land of exile. Uh, so you demonstrate quite clearly that uh, um, the land of exile is a space not only of deprivation, but also of opportunities. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, it's a matter of, uh, we are more or less the, the, the station to which you tune. Um, there are all kinds of channels, and you can decide to tune into the negative channel, or you can tune, tune into the positive channel. Mm -hmm. how, 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 did you, how did you discover that? So I'm selling a self-help book out front. <laughs> um, no well-adjusted person, I think, has ever made great art. So I think probably, I'm, that's an assumption, but I don't, if, if you know anyone better, let me know. Um, and if they have somebody who's probably working for them to produce. So I think all of this and all of that across the street in the museum is somebody's free therapy, basically. Um, to your point, I, again, I feel very fortunate. I think all of us are probably. If we, and if we don't think we are, we're doing better off than people we know or people we don't know. I think I always like to keep in mind that there are people doing a lot worse. Um, but yes, is a short answer. And I th how I think is I've been very lucky. I have people who, who love me, people who remind me that I, I have worth. And I think I was raised with, not in any kind of militaristic sense, but just by being loved, I recognize that I am capable of loving and deserving of loving. Mm -hmm. And therefore, I, 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 when I look at people, and I make work that hopefully reflects the way that they want to be seen and the way that I see them. And I think that just kind of perpetuates the idea that like it's a space that we deserve to be in and we should all feel that way. Um, but if it's a question of how, it's not. Um, I just think that from my point of view, again, recognizing that the others do much less poorly and not because they deserve to, but just because of the nature of fate and how where you're born. And so knowing that, I try to recognize that I don't have a whole lot to shed too many tears about. And so being given this grand gift of being placed where I am, um, it's the onus is upon me to do with that what I can. And what I can do is make the world hopefully a little bit more beautiful than I will leave it at some point. And I think that's what I'm here for. It's, um, I often say if people remember me for making clothes, I've failed phenomenally. But if they remember me for making them and those that they knew feel better about themselves, then Okay, that's something. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and Nusa, uh, at some point, you realized that uh, there was something you needed to do to tell this story. Uh, this story about uh, something that you felt you knew about Africa, but it wasn't the story that you are feeling around you. You had to go to Africa to find the true stories of Africa from the various perspectives of people who live within Africa or the Africa diaspora. Um, that nostalgia that uh, that moved you, uh, how, how did you translate that into the making of art? Um, well, I think one of the, the driving force was wanting to feel a sense of pride um, for where I was from. Um, and I think that the imagery I saw didn't reflect that. And when it showed the African continent, it was animals or, you know, poverty stricken people, Lady Smith, Black Mombazo playing in the background. Like it was just very, a very um, unreal idea of what I knew. Um, and I was inspired by people and I wanted to share that inspiration. Um, and I wanted them to tell their stories, and I wanted the perspective to be 
of their lives. Like I didn't want to just go, hey, Africa's great, guys, but I wanted people living there to tell us what's, what, what their struggles were, but what their solutions, because I think it's very dangerous to play this Africa rising narrative out and seem as though there's no issues. Mm -hmm. But I think I wanted to go from focusing on what the problems are to focusing on the solution to those problems so that we could start thinking about the hope that's there. Mm -hmm. And not just for the outside, but for ourselves um, and for myself. Um, and I wanted it to be wholly African uh, in that I wanted my cinematographer to be from the continent. Mm -hmm. I wanted the music that we played to reflect the places that we were visiting and not just like tribal music, but like contemporary music of people who are creating. You know, I, I really wanted, I really, the, sh the show really is a showcase of the cities. The cities themselves are characters in the show. Um, and the creators are, cre are there because of what the city is and the dynamics of the city. They're not there just because, you know, it wouldn't be the same person in, I don't know, Champaign, Illinois, for example. Like those cities make you a certain way. Um, and each piece, um, I, I, it was about making it a love letter to that city um, and giving people a sense of curiosity um, about what else they could find in that city um, and really giving the people featured a chance to speak their truth um, and show their genius. Because as far as I'm concerned, everyone who was coming up with the solution it was is this little bit of genius. Because it wasn't like things that I, I were being replicated. It wasn't a cut and paste model for a lot of them. Like it was like ideas that no one else was thinking about. Um, and then it was also the grit of the human spirit. When, I'm, when I say grit, I mean as far as like the surfers, for example, in Dakar, um, who like, there are some of them were surfing on like, um, 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 his name escapes me, but he was surfing on um, a broken board. And that was kind of how he was able to do his thing. And, uh, he was also inspiring other kids. So while we were filming, we saw other kids who were taking little planks, you know, and trying to surf on them. And it was like, it's a ripple effect of not just saying, this is great, but I'm saying, this can inspire other people to think about themselves differently, inspire other African kids around the continent, or even kids who are living here who don't have a sense of where they're from to see other people that look like us doing something that might seem like a reach or might seem like something that African people don't do or black people don't do. Um, it was saying these are different ways of being, these are different ways of existing. Hopefully we're able to see a piece of ourselves in these characters. Um, and that was it. I, I really just wanted it to be something that was reflective of the place we were in with, within each episode. Thank you so much. Um, uh, I, I probably should just ask one last round of questions about uh, um, in this process of making Africa, how do you want your work to make Africa? I will tell you. <laughs> um, wow. <laughs> yeah, I've been hungry because. So I have this um, possibly like slightly <laughs> cliche thing that I that I really believe in now as far as how we see the African continent from outside, or how the African continent, rather I should say, how people outside the African continent see it from outside. Um, because, you know, even just up here, right, we're from the same place and all of our stories are so different. Um, and the ways that we choose to tell those stories are so different. Um, I really believe that every single person represents themselves um, 
And so for me, the way that I would uh, like to have an impact on that story and what I really feel like is uh, the core of my work is this deep, deep belief that historic and, you know, indigenous ways of seeing the world and, and um, ways of seeing being and people um, are still relevant and are possibly the most relevant that they have ever been. Because I think that um, even in, for example, the poof that you showed, right, there, there are all these ways in which Africa is, a, is like an incubation space. It's a space where so many um, solutions to problems are being generated, like Nosa said, um, in ways that because of different things, maybe it's our comfort here, or um, maybe it's just not being in those spaces, um, uh, not being in those situations that we couldn't think of. And I think that Africa is actually the future, you know? It's been said over and over in different ways, but I really do believe it. I, I think that um, the mark that I hope to have is to help people um, be able to see Africa in that way. Africa, in a lot of ways, is solving um, and, and working through problems that uh, are impending dooms basically here in the West um, and, and it's generating the solutions to a lot of things like sustainability um, and like the height of neoliberalism. How do you deal with despotic leaders? <laughs> things like that, that um, mm. I, I think people are just now starting to realize is actually a real problem here. Um, so that's hopefully what I, I hope to give as far as um, my bit in, in making how Africa is seen. Thank you. Wale. So in general, one would never say, I'm, I'm going to go eat some European food mm. or how's the weather in Europe? <laughs> European music is amazing. You just wouldn't because you know better. Whereas, as, as, an, as a globe, we're still working with the idea of like that for, for other parts of the world. Um, so if anything, what interests me though is that perspective and that discussion as had by people of African descent. Because we consume the imagery that's created for the most part by the creators. And because historically we have not been the creators, we are oftentimes subject to the same biases that are thrust upon us. So if I'm afraid of my own people because I watch television that makes us all look like a threat, if I have the same biases towards Africans, I'm speaking generally, as somebody in middle wherever who's never met an African person, that's a problem for them, but it's much more a problem for me because I should know better. And so what happens when people like us are privileged enough to create imagery that not only speaks to the world, but importantly, reminds us, us being those of us who live in these places, of the innate talent, beauty, and grace that we hold. That, I think, is kind of the ultimate mission that we're all addressing from different angles. Um, and so it's almost like a, if you think of it in cynical terms, it's a, a giant branding effort to rebrand what is Africa in all of our minds? Um, and how can that be something that's much more open, much more honest and authentic to what it really is? So. Thank you. Musa. Um, um, so in telling all these stories of fantastic people living on the continent and doing amazing things, I also want to be able to share the stories of, that are random and boring and just people being people. Um, one of the things I found being here, and I don't know if anyone else feels this, or any of you guys feel this rather, but like if I ever hear that a Nigerian did something, I'm like, oh, hopefully it's good. Like I don't want to, like if they're like some scam happened, I'm like, please God, don't let it be Nigerian. Please don't. Because it feels like we've been assigned these labels, you know, that it's hard to break free and you're like, trying to be the best representative of where you're from because the ideas of what, who we are and what we make up are so small. Whereas like, on the other hand, like, you know, 
so many things happen in other communities specifically and i'm going to speak to the uh, uh, mainstream level like if someone who's white does something we don't label that because there's such a dearth of stories there's so many different examples of what it is to be a white person living on this on this world in this world whereas with black people and african people there's just so many specific things that I would like to put out work that shows a variety of stories and a variety of realities um, so that we can kind of start to diversify how we speak about Africans, how we speak about black people, so that I don't have to cringe if someone who's black does something that, that makes me feel less proud. Because it's that kind of freedom to not feel like you're being prejudged once you walk into a room because of the color of your skin or your name or where you're from. Like, I would like to create enough content that we are now free to act as, you know, act as we would like and not feel like we are validating a stereotype that might be out there about us. That's what I hope to create. Thank you so much. Um, I I'm sure the, the audience has uh, questions for our artist. Um, yes, please. I think I can talk loud enough to project, but let me know. Um, so I actually just moved back from Africa, and I was working as a product designer for consumer electronics. Um, you can ask me later if you're curious about the specifics. But one of the challenges that I found um, was I was living in Uganda, which is tiny. And, uh, and I have worked in Nigeria, which is very large. But uh, almost all of you, I don't know about Yunusa, are Yoruba. And I'm wondering how, how you, as representatives of this and as sort of emissaries of this culture change and this rebranding effort, are trying to access and integrate all of this wide, that just vast, wide variety of colors and flavors that really defines each country and each tribe and each sub-region on the continent distinctly from one another. Because I know that that's something that, as a product designer, trying to understand how best to create something that would satisfy people in northern Nigeria and Zambia and you know maybe Senegal or wherever, um, that that was one of the biggest challenges that I found. And it seems to be the sort of country of Africa mentality is one of the hardest things to kind of break through. <laughs> I mean, I'm going to give you a non-answer. I, I found it like the, so the way that I do that with what I do is I talk to people in, in ways that they can relate to people, each other as people. So it's not so much about you're an Igbo person, you're a Yoruba person, you're Mexican, you're Honduran. It's about what is a memory of your mother that you enjoy from, you know, things that, human universal questions. And I think it might surprise you, you know, I can't speak to what you do specifically, but even from a product level, that may actually be more effective. Mm. Obviously, we don't all love the same flavors, but we all have those same memories and those same touch points as human beings. And that ends up being a more global way to speak to each other. And it speaks more broadly, because that way, somebody who is not of African descent can maybe look different, but feel the same. Okay, yeah, so I'm going to answer as like a post-colonial academe theorist nerd, yeah, who's also a designer that, um, you know, is really invested in product design and has been constantly trying to navigate this conundrum of how does this get mass produced? How do you make this for, you know, a wide range of people, which I've, of course, like, just gone the other way, right? Like, I have <laughs> pieces that are literally, like, this is not only, like, not just for everyone, this is also for people of, like, a specific, you know, ontological way of being and subjectivity within <laughs> my cultural belief system. But I think for me, the thing that's interesting or the thing that actually unifies in a lot of uh, uh, a lot of the rest of the world without generalizing is this um this contrast that was created through colonialism right and and continues to be created 
like recreated through post-colonialism, which is these very different ways of like seeing and being in the world. I always come back to this. Um, there's a really fantastic, brilliant scholar um, by the name of um, Juan Garzon. And he talks about how in the time of the Anthropocene, this time where human beings have taken over nature and we're basically doing an amazing job at ruining everything and you know um, we're, we're having this really deep crisis where we don't know if by I think it's like 2040 or something if the world will actually still be inhabitable um, that actually the ways of seeing and the ways of being that would have resolved this and, and that we really need right now are the very same ways of seeing and being and existing that were destroyed by colonialism or that were sought to be destroyed by colonialism. And it's this way of being with, of being within the world, of being with nature, of seeing um, things that we usually think of as objects as alive and, and, and really trying to challenge every single thing that, um, you know, that our education um, tells us about like what is, what is a subject and what is an object um, and using that to relook at the world that we've created. And um, I think that that is something that's a through line, right? Because it's, it's indigenous to a lot of place in a lot of different ways. It looks a lot of, uh, uh, it looks very different in a lot of ways, but it is a through line um, in fighting to, uh, fighting to try to get that way of like, that philosophy of being to continue to exist is something that I believe is like present, not just all over the African continent, but in places like South America and places like Asia. Um, so that to me is like the starting point. It's like a complete, pivot um, entirely, but it is a, it's a, it's a hard question, and it's, in, and it's a continuous conundrum, but I, I think, like, can't go wrong by, you know, trying to, like, see, like, okay, what am I not seeing, and push completely outside of your perspective. Um, with, with our project, um, with My Africa, is, there's a very, there's an emphasis on cities, and maps, <laughs> and this is where this is it. This is this this is where this lives on the map, and this is where this place um, exists. And we try to give a little bit of a history lesson about the town, um, so that people are able to get a better understanding of where we are and why we're there. Um, we're specific about the music that we use, um, not as far as like language, but like. I'll use popular Nigerian or popular Kenyan or popular Senegalese uh, music. Um, and then, you know, trying to incorporate, we, we try to get, we like, we'll ask people, what do you want us to cover? Um, so that it's a crowdsourced way of telling stories. So it's not like, these are the things I think are cool because what makes me an authority on any other African country? Like, what makes me an authority on? Nigeria, you know, just because there's so many different realities. So we try to get as much crowdsourced information from the countries that we're planning on filming in before we actually go. And we um, try to incorporate as much um, musically or and even as far as whoever the cinematographer is uh, to make sure we have that local element and local content because we're basically guilty of the same thing if we're just kind of telling stories from our perspective. Yes, please. Thank you guys for, sorry if I'm not loud enough, I'm very okay. Thank you guys for um, being here. I'm also Nigerian, um, first born in my family to be born here. And it's a question, but more of like a conversation starter, we may not have time for it. Um, in terms of when you were talking about Exodus and you know that necessary to return, and, Mukhtari, you were talking about how feeling that like that outsider of, but when you were home, you were, you know, it was your about in your home and whatnot. And for me, it's more of, I felt that outsider though. I've, only, I've always been here. I visited Nigeria a couple of times, but I've always been here. Everything I know is more American, but there's still this like, uh, 
feeling of not belonging and not wanting to be here and wanting to go back home. But what is home? It's this, this romanticized idea when your parents are like, don't go there, this is what it's like, where everywhere else it's like. But Instagram says Nigeria is like this. <laughs> <laughs> and for me, it's more of, I'm not an artist, but um, I am in a non-traditional non career, I'm a midwife. So for me, it's more of like, how do I bring that back while also not influencing things that I've learned in the West of like how we go back to help our people or like, you know, I'm really trying to figure out how do we fill that space with those of us who were raised here and who been here for a couple of few decades and wanting to go exist there and have other generations there. Um, I can speak to when I moved back in 20, I moved back in 2010 and I moved back I moved back as um, an activist to get young people to vote in the elections that were coming up in 2011. And I moved back with this idea of, I know everything. Like, I've experienced democracy. I know better than everybody. Like, these are the ideas. Just implement them. Whereas, like, what I learned, what there was a rude awakening of, you have to listen to what people need. Like, you don't know the realities till you're there, until you live them. And I think that um, as people going back, even if you're from Nigeria, like even if your parents are Nigerian, it's gonna be an alien uh, existence for you just because you've never been there before. Um, obviously, I think there will be successes based on the fact that you have probably a huge body of knowledge, you know, that you can bring to the table, but it's really important to just listen. Um, and get a sense of what people need, especially in the, in the medical field, because people have their own practices, obviously. And it's like, there's probably a way you can incorporate them in some way. Um, but just like, go there as an open book, see what, where you fit in, as opposed to trying to jam yourself. I've, tr I've tried it, it didn't work. Um, just kind of seeing how you can fit in in there. Kaleo, um, thank you for doing this, Koyo. Um, the young sister who is the midwife talks to me later. Um, as an artist, a multidisciplinary artist and myself, and a designer, born and raised here in the U.S., but also being Yoruba, Edo on my father's side, you know, Khan and Congo on my mother's side. So I hear in like talks like this and conversations like panels from art exhibits or other academic projects, but also in just general, you know, one on one conversations. I hear us as a people, especially it doesn't matter the generation, whether it's your age age grade or Moyo and I and everything in between and outside. I always hear this distinction, especially amongst black folks and non-black people who say, well, you're black and you're African. All black people are Africans. <laughs> All black people are Africans. Maybe, and I think that a, a lot of the issues and the questions like you raised about being a um, developing products and just being and making Africa is no one wants to accept blackness and Africanness as something that's okay and extremely diverse extremely ancient, actually the first, but yet we're still outsiders, outside of everything. And so I wanted to ask if you think that, especially given your generation, that if we start to reclaim, because we're talking about exodus, exile, and exit, but also there has to be reclamation, uh, or even recalibration 
about how we think of ourselves as African slash black folks, where there's where you, you might be a continental born African or continentally raised, but those of us who are diaspora Africans, we're still the same, but yet there's a difference. And yet somehow we don't want to embrace our sameness through our differences in making Africa. I think anyone who sees a distinction, and people still do, just hasn't been around enough. And that sounds flippant and dismissive, but I think it's true. I think that the reason I'm so, I, I don't see a distinction. I've lived in America at this point the majority of my life, but I, to me it's interchangeable. I grew up in Nigeria, I am Nigerian, I'm also American, and it's, it's just like, it's one and the same. I like rock and roll, I like rap music, it's the same person. But I know that because I've experienced intimately both cultures. People who haven't had the gift and the luxury of that experience maybe don't have that knowledge of just the awareness. And so I think it requires a degree of patience, knowing that everybody hasn't had the fortune of, of what may seem like a, a difficult journey at first, but it's actually a gift. And also just like being aware that there needs to be an education and we have work to do on both sides of the continent. And that work is because we generally don't yet love ourselves enough. And so that's not really, for me, that's a problem for us to work out. And I say us being Africans and African Americans is like, this is very silly, to be honest with you. And you need to go over there or meet somebody, have a conversation. This, I mean, the same way we have distinctions or talk about distinctions between different ethnicities within the US. To me, it's frankly, it's no different. If you get to know somebody, whether it be in a barber shop or a coworker or whatever, you're like, oh, this is really stupid. It's the same thing. We just need to talk to each other. Yeah, I, I realize that sounds kind of dismissive, but I think it actually is that simple. So, I mean, you're it, talking about like literally thousands of years of issues. Yes. And in, in a two-minute conversation. No, and it's oh, a two so minutes. You're, you're convincing. Yeah, yes. <laughs> but but it, it, is, it's, it is human experience. I mean, there's, there is no way to lecture. There's no picture. There's no movie. You're gonna, Black Panther is great, and I think it's a fantastic step. There is no Chadwick Boseman movie or no uh, Michael B. Jordan abs that are going to cure this issue. <laughs> It is experience, it is human contact, and I've had the luxury of decades at this point of human contact, and so I'm here now, and so everybody hasn't had that, but that's what it's gonna take. And so I think there's no quick like fixer up, it's gonna take like proximity to people, and that all of this, it's always about human proximity. There are likely people in this room who've never met an African, or a, a black, how many female black designers do we know? I don't know many. How many? What, what was I, I don't know many. How many designers who look like this do we know? Generally, not many. But now that you meet one, like, oh, they're regular people. And so the idea being when you have proximity to a culture, to a people, you understand them as people. And I think that's just, just frankly, is what it takes. And so it's, it's, it's us doing basically, this is out, out, like outreach. And if it's PR, for the global <coughs> point of getting us to know each other better. Thank you. Can I? Um, I think we have to think about what each side has been getting as far as media representation. I, when I was growing up in, in Nigeria in the 90s, like we had a lot of like rap music. Um, we had Boys in the Hood came out. I saw House Party when I was there. You know, like so I had a very small idea of what it meant to be African American. And then on this side, people are getting images of poverty, images of, you know, wars. And so there's like, in that media representation, I think there's a blockade created between Africans in the, on, the, in, on the continent being like, well, I'm not that. And people here being like, well, I'm not that, you know? And so we're already, when we meet, we're already at odds because it's like, there's been gradients given to each person based on where, you know, whether they're African or whether they're African American. Um, on our end, we've actually, we, we're, we're finalizing a curriculum that's gonna get my Africa's into classrooms um, in uh, middle schools in the US, 
which to me is important because I think that kids who are, you know, we're gonna start in urban areas, but it's important for, to me for those kids to know that there's other options and there's other places that they can go. Because we, that's not an education that we're getting, right? That's not an education the kids are getting. So we could talk about it and wax poetic all we want, but I think if you're not introduced, if you're not introduced to an idea early on, or like the idea of what people are like, it's just going to keep being perpetuated until people decide they want to travel or visit, you know, and and vice versa. So I think it's really tackling that media representation between the two and getting it to be more fair and balanced. Thank you so much. Um, I would like to uh, thank these uh, incredible. Uh, artist and uh, uh, they, they've demonstrated that uh, despite all of the attempts by my generation to uh, <laughs> erase all the creativity in them, uh, they are actually able to continue to transform that continent in ways that are beyond our own imagination. And I'd like to t thank uh, the Blanton Museum for doing this uh, wonderful, wonderful uh, event. Yeah. <laughs>